half an hour, the deliberation was completed, and to my surprise, the great circle broke up into squads and companies of fours and sixes and tens, and then each disappeared slowly and steadily with lockstep, passing out of the city into dark or only partially lighted chambers and passages that surrounded it. The search for the missing pseudopsy had been begun. It was hours before the last squad had returned to the square and the great circle had been formed again. Alas, the news was sad indeed. There came no tidings of the missing man. He was lost forever. And with clasped hands and slow and heavy step, the grieving former folk made their way back to their homes, where the sign women and children were awaiting their coming. As Bulger and I went back to bed again, it almost seemed to me as if I could hear at times the deep and long-drawn sighs that escaped from the gentle breasts of the sorrowing Sudopsis. I noticed a very touching thing on the following day. It was that every man, woman, and child in the city of Silver grieved for the lost Sudopsy as if he were actually brother to each one of them. Love was not as with us in the upper world a thing bestowed upon those in whom we see our own faces repeated and in whose voices we hear our own ring out again sweet and clear as in our childhood in other words a love almost of our very selves oh no while it was true that a mother's touch was most tender to her own child yet no little hand stretched out to her went without its caress she was mother to them all to her they were all beautiful and as their little frocks were all woven in the same loom, there never could come into her mind a temptation to feel whether a rich neighbor's child was playing with hers, and that therefore it ought to receive a more loving caress. In that portion of the city where the children had their playgrounds, the silver pavement was in some places marked off with raised lines and letters, something after the manner of our hopscotch, for the purpose of a game which was very popular with the little Sodopsies. Its name is hard to translate, but it meant something like Little Boogeyman. And many an hour had Bulger and I stood there watching these silent little gnomes at play, fascinated by the wonderful skill which they would display in feigning the drawing near the Little Boogeyman, their hiding from him, his stealthy approach, the increasing danger, the attack, the escape, the new dangers, wild flight, and mad pursuit. Fancy, therefore, my astonishment one morning to note that Bulger was coaxing me thither, although the place was quite deserted, the children being all at their lessons. But as it was a rule of mine always to humor Bulger's whims, I went patiently along. In a moment, as we came to the spot where the pavement was marked off and inscribed as I have explained, he halted and with an anxious whine began to play the game of the little boogeyman, turning every now and then to see what effect his actions had upon me. He made no mistakes. As he entered each compartment, he rested his paw upon the raised letters, as he had so often seen the children do with their little bare feet, and then mimic with wonderful fidelity their actions, beginning with the first scent of danger and ending with mad terror at the close pursuit of the boogeyman. I was more than surprised. I was bewildered by this piece of mimicry on Bulger's part. To my mind, it boded some terrible accident to him, for I have a superstitious notion that great danger to an animal's life gives him for the moment an almost human intelligence. It is nature caring for her own. But all of a sudden the real truth in this case burst upon me. It was not my dear little brother giving me to understand that some peril was threatening him, but that some danger was hanging over my head, the more real in that it was unseen and unsuspected by me. I called him to me and rewarded him with a caress. He was overjoyed to note that I had apparently understood him. I now made haste to seek out Barrelbrow. He was surprised to feel my salutation. In a moment or so I had told him all. Nor was he slow in detecting my excitement. He no doubt felt that in the changed character of my handwriting. Calm thyself, little baron, he wrote. The wise Bulger has told the truth. Thy life is in danger. I had resolved to send for thee this very day to warn thee of it, to bid thee quit the land of the former folk in all haste, for the notion had spread among our people that it was the dancing spectre at thy heels which caused the death of the gentle pouting lip, who disappeared so mysteriously the other day. I therefore counsel thee that thou make ready at once to quit our city to-morrow, before the clocks rouse the people from their sleep. I thanked Barrelbrow and promised that I would heed his advice. Although I confessed to him that I would fain have bided a few weeks longer, there were so many things in and about the wonderful city of silver that I had not seen. 
but I owed it to the dear hearts of my own world to take the best care of my life, insignificant though it might appear to me. Then again I felt that it would be madness to attempt to reason with the Pseudopsies. To them the dancing spectre at my heels was a real being of flesh and blood, although they had not been able to seize him, and it was really natural for them to suspect that we had made away with pouting lip. Calling out to Bulger to follow me, I left Barrel Brow's home, resolved to make one more round of the wonderful city, and then pack up some food and clothing and be all ready for a start before the clocks began their tapping. I should explain, dear friends, that as happens in all cities, the people of this one imagined at times that they hadn't quite elbow room enough, and hence they surveyed other chambers and set up new candelabra within them in order to chase the cold and dampness away and make them fit for human habitations. In the last one, which they had in this way annexed to their fair city, fitting it with a silver doorway and tiling the floor with polished plates of the same beautiful metal, they had discovered a hard mound, apparently of rock in one corner, and had resolved that they would come some day with their drills and picks and begin the task of removing this mound. A strange inclination came upon me to visit this new chamber in order to inspect the work of these eyeless workmen, and see how far they had proceeded with their task of transforming a cold and rocky vault into a bright, warm, healthy habitation. Imagine my surprise to hear Bulger utter a low growl as we reached the entrance, and I put out my hand to swing the door open, for the Pseudopsies were not at work there that day, and the place was as silent as a tomb. Glancing through the grating, a sight met my gaze which caused my flesh to creep and my hair to stiffen. What think ye was it? Why, the mound in the corner was rocking and swaying, and from underneath one end issued a loud and angry hissing. I'm no coward if I do say it myself, but this was just a little too much for ordinary or even extraordinary flesh to bear without flinching. I staggered back with a suppressed cry of horror and was upon the point of breaking into a mad flight, when the thought flashed through my mind that the door was securely fastened, and that there would be no danger in my taking another look at the terrible monster thus caged in this chamber. A great snake-like head was now lifted from beneath one edge of the mound, and on the end of a long, swaying neck, its great round eyes, big as an ox's, stared with dull, cold, glassy look from wall to wall, and then with an awful outburst of hissing, the whole mound was suddenly raised upon four great legs, thick as posts, and ending in terrible claws, and borne rocking and swaying into the center of the chamber. What was this terrible monster, and where had it come from? Why, I saw through it all now at a glance. It was a gigantic tortoise eight feet long by five wide at least, and once an inhabitant of the upper world, thousands and thousands of years ago, by the coming of the awful fields of ice it had been forced to fly from certain death by crawling down into these underground caverns. Here, chilled and numbed by the dampness and cold, it had fallen asleep, and would have continued to sleep on for other ages to come had not the industrious form of folk lighted the clusters of burning jets of gas in the monster's bedroom. Gradually the warmth had penetrated the roof of shell, made thicker by earth and layer of broken rock, which the tooth of time had dropped upon it, and reached his great heart and set it beating again, slowly, very slowly, but faster and faster until he really felt that he had awakened from his long sleep. By a terrible misfortune, Pouting Lip, the gentle Sodoxy, had happened to be left behind when his brother laborers quit work, and the new silver doors of the chamber had been closed upon him. Oh, it was terrible to think of, but true it must have been. The poor little Sodopsy, shut in by his own eyeless folk in this chamber, which he was helping to beautify by his patient skill, had served to satisfy the hunger of this awful monster after his long ages of fasting. But why, you ask, dear friends, was all this not discovered when the great circle had been formed, and the search was made for him? Simply because the monster, after devouring the lost Sudopsy, retreated to his nest and drew the dirt and crumbled rock up around him with his gigantic flippers and went to sleep again, as all gorged reptiles do. 
so that when the searchers entered the new chamber, all was as they had left it, the mound of rock, as they had supposed it to be, in the corner, undisturbed. With Bulger at my heels, I now turned and ran with such mad haste to Barrel Brows that the whole city was thrown into the wildest disorder, for of course they had felt me fly past them. With all the quickness I could command, I wrote an account of what I had witnessed, and when Barrel Brow communicated it to the assembled Sudopsies, a thousand hands flew into the air in token of mingled fright and wonder, and a wild rush was made for Bulger and me, and we were well nigh smothered with kisses and caresses. The moment the excitement had quieted down a little, a great circle was immediately formed, and I was honored with a place in it. And when my tablet was passed about, a thousand hands made signs of assent. My plan was a simple one. It was to make a pipe connection between Upaslop and the new chamber, and to turn the deadly vapor into the sleeping apartment of the gigantic monster. In this manner, his dispatch would be a happy one, merely a beginning of another one of his long naps so far as he would know anything about it. This was done at once, care first being taken to make the doors of the new chamber perfectly airtight. I was the first to enter the cavern after the execution of the monster, and found to my delight that my estimate of his length and width was correct almost to an inch. I had always had a wonderful eye for dimension and distances. Seen Bulger raising himself upon his hind legs and make an effort to dislodge something from the wall, I drew near to assist him. Alas, it was dear, gentle, pouting lips tapping. He had been riding upon it, and as the terrible monster advanced upon him, he had reached up and hung it upon a silver pin on the wall. When the Sudopsies read what their poor brother had written, there they all sat down and wrung their hands in silent but awful grief. It ran as follows. O oh, my people, why have ye abandoned me? The air trembles, the whole place is filled with suffocating odor. Must I die? Alas, I fear it, and yet I would so love to feel my dear one's touch as once more. The ground trembles, a stifling breath is puffed into my face. I am wearied, almost fainting by trying to escape it. I can write no more. Don't grieve too long over me. It was my fault. I stayed behind when I should have followed. Oh, horrible, horrible. Farewell. I'm going now. Beloved touch to all. Farewell. After waiting a few days for the grief of the former folk to lighten a little, I asked them to send a number of their most skillful workmen to assist me in removing the magnificent shell from the dead monster whose body was fed to the fishes. They not only did this, but they also offered to transform the shell into a beautiful boat for me, so that when I resolved to bid them adieu, I might sail away from the city of silver and not be obliged to trudge along the marble highway. The work went on apace. At first, the polishers began their task, and in a few days the mighty carapace glowed like a lady's comb. Then the dainty and cunning craftsmen in silver began their part of the work and ere many days the shell was fitted with a silver prow curiously wrought like a swan's neck and head while quaintly carved trimmings ran here and there and a dainty pair of silver skulls with a silver rudder beautifully chased from which ran two little silken ropes were added to the outfit i never had seen anything half so rich and rare and I was as proud of it as a young king of his throne before he finds it is so much like my ship of shell. And last, the day came when I was to bid the gentle Sudopsies a long farewell. They lined the shore as Bulger and I proceeded to take our place in the bark of shell, which sat upon the water like a thing of life. It was with great show of dignity that Bulger took his position in the stern with the tiller ropes in his mouth, ready to pull on either side as I might direct. And setting the silver oars in place, I threw my weight upon them, and away we glided, swiftly and noiselessly over the surface of the dark and sluggish stream. In a few moments, nothing but a faint glimmer was left to remind us of the wonderful city of silver, where the silent former folk live and love and labor, without ever a thought that human beings could be any happier than they. Dear, happy folk, they have solved a mighty problem of which we of the upper world are still struggling over. End of chapter 20
Chapter 21 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M.B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 21. How we were lighted on our way down the dark and silent river. Sudden and fierce onslaught upon our beautiful boat of shell. A fight for life against terrible odds, and how Bulger stood by me through it all. Cold air and lumps of ice. Our entry into the cavern whence they came. The boat of shell comes to the end of its voyage. Sunlight in the world within a world and all about the wonderful window through which it poured, and the mysterious land it lighted. I dare say, dear friends, that you are puzzling your brains to think out how it was possible for me to row away from the wonderful city of the Formifolk without running our boat continually ashore. Ah, you forget that the keen-eyed Bulger was at the helm, and that it was not the first time that he had piloted me through darkness impenetrable to my eyes. But more than this, I soon discovered that the plashing of my silver oars kept my little friends, the fire lizards, in a constant state of alarm. And although I couldn't hear the crackling of their tails, yet the tiny flashes of light served to outline the shore admirably. So I pulled away with a will, and down this dark and silent river, for there was a current, although hardly perceptible, Bulger and I were borne along in the beautiful bark of tortoiseshell, with its prow of carved and burnished silver. During my sojourn in the land of the Pseudopsies, I had one day, while calling upon the learned barrel brow, noticed a beautifully carved silver hand lamp of the Pompeian pattern among his curiosities. I asked him if he knew what it was. He replied that he did, adding that it had doubtless been brought from the upper world by his people and he begged me to accept it as a keepsake. I did so, and upon leaving the city of silver, I filled it with fish oil and fitted a silken wick to it. It was well that I had done so, for after a while the fire lizards disappeared entirely, and Bulger and I would have been left in total darkness had I not drawn forth my beautiful silver lamp, lighted it, and suspended it from the beak of the silver swan, which curved its graceful neck above the bow of our boat. After lying on my oars long enough to set some food before Bulger and partake of some myself, I again started on my voyage down the silent river, no longer shrouded in impenetrable gloom. I had not taken over half a dozen strokes, when suddenly one of my oars was almost twisted out of my hand by a vicious tug from some inhabitant of these dark and sluggish waters. I resolved to quicken my stroke in order to escape another such a wrench. For the silver oars fashioned by the Pseudopsies for me were a very delicate make, intended only for very gentle usage. Suddenly another vicious snap was made at my other oar, and this time the animal succeeded in retaining its hold, for I dared not attempt to wrench the oar out of its grip for fear of breaking it. It was a large crustacean of the crab family, and its milk-white shell gave it a ghost-like look as it struggled about in the black waters, fiercely intent to keep its hold upon the oar. The next instant a similar creature had fastened firmly upon my other oar, and there I sat utterly helpless. But worse than this, the dark waters were now fairly alive with these white armored guards of this underworld stream, each apparently bent upon setting an immediate end to my progress through their domain. They now began a series of furious efforts to lay hold of the sides of my boat with their large claws, but happily its polished surface made this impossible for them to accomplish. Up to this moment, Bulger had not stirred a muscle or uttered a sound, but now a sharp growl from him told me that something serious had happened at his end of the boat. It was serious indeed for several of the largest of the fierce crustaceans had laid hold of the rudder and were wrenching it from side to side as if to tear it off. Every attempt, of course, caused a tug at the tiller ropes held between Bulger's teeth. But bracing himself firmly, he resisted their furious efforts as well as he could and succeeded in saving the rudder for the time being. All of a sudden, our frail bark of shell crashed into some sort of obstruction and came to a dead standstill. Peering into the darkness to my horror, I saw that the wily enemy had spanned the river with chains made up of living links by each laying hold of his neighbor's claw. 
the chain thus formed being then rendered almost as strong as steel by the interweaving of their double rows of small hooked legs our advance was not only blocked but death an awful death seemed to be staring us in the face for what possible hope of escape could there be if Bulger and I should leap into the water, now alive with these fast-swimming creatures, whirling their huge claws about in search for some way to get at us? From the brave manner in which Bulger was holding the madly swinging helm, I saw that he was determined not to surrender. But alas, bravery is but a sorry thing for two to fight a thousand with. And yet I had not lost my head. Don't think that. True, I was hard-pressed. The very dust of the balance, if thicker on their side, might make my scale kick the beam. I had hauled both oars into the boat by reaching over and beating off the claws fastened upon them, and had up to this moment driven back every one of the fierce creatures which had succeeded in throwing one of its claws over the edge of the boat. But now, to my horror, I felt that our little craft was being slowly but surely drawn stern first toward the river bank. In order to accomplish this, the crustaceans had thrown out a line composed of their bodies gripped together and had made it fast to the rudder. Not an instant was to be lost. Once upon the river bank, the fierce creatures would swarm around us by the ten thousands, drag us down, pinch us to death, and tear us piecemeal. An idea flashed upon me. It was this. It is folly to attempt to resist these countless swarms of crustaceans by the use of one pair of weak hands, even though they be aided by Bulger's keen and willing teeth. We should, after a brief struggle, go down as the brave man in the sewer went down, when the famished rats leapt upon him from every side at once, or as the stray buffalo goes down when the pack of ravenous wolves closes up its circle about him. If I am to save my life, it must be by striking a blow that will reach every one of these small but fierce enemies at the same instant, and thus paralyze them, or at least bewilder them, until I can succeed in making my escape. Quickly drawing my brace of pistols, I held their muzzles close to the water, and discharged them at the same instant. The effect was terrific. Like a crash of a terrible thunderbolt, the report burst forth and echoed through these vast and silent chambers, until it seemed as if the great vaulted roof of rock had by some awful convulsion of nature been cast roaring and rattling down upon the face of these black and sluggish waters. When the smoke had cleared away, a strange but welcome sight met my gaze. Tens of thousands of the huge crabs floated lifeless upon the surface of the river, with their shells split by the concussion the full length of their bodies. It proved to have been a masterly stroke on my part, and, dear friends, you will believe me when I tell you that I drew a deep breath as I set my silver oars against the thole pins, and having worked my boat clear of the swarm of stunned crustaceans, rowed away for dear life. Dear life, ah yes, dear life, for whose life is not dear to him, even though it be dark and gloomy at times? Is there not always something or someone to live for? Is there not always a glimmer of hope that the morrow's sun will go up brighter than it did this morning? Well, anyway, I repeat that I rode away for dear life while Bulger held the tiller ropes and kept our frail bark of polished shell in the middle of the stream. Whether the air was actually colder, or whether it was merely the natural chill that so often strikes the human heart after it had been beating and throbbing with alternate hope and fear, I couldn't say at the time. But I knew this much, that I suddenly found myself suffering from the cold. For the first time since my descent into the world within a world, the air nipped my fingertips. That soft, balmy, June-like atmosphere was gone, and I made haste to put on my fur-trimmed top coat which I had not made much use of lately. At that moment, one of my oars struck against some hard substance floating in the waters. I put out my hand to feel of it. To my great surprise, it proved to be a lump of ice, and very soon another and another went floating by us. We were most surely entering a region where it was cold enough to make ice. I was not sorry for this, for to tell the truth, Bulger and I were both beginning to feel the effects of our long sojourn in the rocky chambers of this underworld, whose atmosphere, though soft and warm, yet lacked the elasticity of the open air. Ice caverns would be a complete change, and the cold air would no doubt send our blood tingling through our veins, just as if we were out a-slaying in the upper world on a winter's night, when the stars twinkle over our heads and the snow crystals creak beneath our runners. 
Soon now, huge icicles began to dot the roof of rock that spanned the river, and shafts and columns of ice dimly visible along the shore seemed to be standing there like silent sentries, watching our boat as it threaded its way through the ever-narrowing channel. And now, too, a faint glow of light reached us from I knew not where, so that by straining my eyes I could see that the river had taken a sweep and entered a vast cavern with roof and walls of ice fretted and carved into fantastic depths and niches and shelves and cornices with here and there shapes so fanciful that it seemed to me i had entered some vast hall of statuary where hero and warrior nymph and maiden shepherd and bird catcher filled these shelves and niches in glorious array farther advance by water was impossible for the blocks of ice knitted together like a flow closed the river completely. I therefore determined to make a landing, draw my boat upon the shore, and continue my journey on foot. The mysterious light, which up to this moment had shed its pale glimmer like an arctic night upon the roofs and walls of ice of these silent chambers, now began to strengthen so that Bulger and I had no difficulty in picking our way along the shore. In fact, we crossed and recrossed the river itself when the whim seized us, for it now went winding on ahead of us like a broad ribbon of ice through caverns and corridors. Suddenly I came to a halt and stood as motionless as the fantastic forms of ice surrounding me. What could it mean? Were my eyes weakened by my long sojourn in the world within a world, playing me cruel tricks? Surely there can be no mistake, I whispered to myself. That light yonder, which pours its glorious effulgence upon those spires and pinnacles, those towers and turrets of ice, is the sunshine of the upper world. Can it be that my marvelous underground journey is ended, that I stand upon the threshold of the upper world once more? Bulger, too, recognizes this flood of sunshine, and breaking out into a fit of joyous barking, dashes on ahead to be the first one to feel its gentle warmth after our long journey through the dark and silent passages of the world within a world. But I dare not trust my eyes, and fearing lest he should fall into some ambush or meet with some dread accident, I called him back to me. Together we hurry along as rapidly as possible. Now I note that we are drawing near to the end of the vast corridor through which we have been making our way for some time and that we stand upon the portal of a mighty subterranean region lighted with real sunlight. It stretches away as far as the eye can reach, and so high is the roof that spans this vast underworld that I cannot see whether it be of ice or not. All that I can see is that through one of its sloping sides there streams a mighty torrent of sunlight which pours its splendor with unstinting hand upon the wide highways, the broad terraces, the sheer parapets, and the sloping banks which diversify this ice world. Can it be that one side of this mighty mountain which nature has here hollowed out and set like a peaked roof over this vast subterranean region is a gigantic window of ice itself through which the sunlight of the outer world streams in this grand way like a silent cataract of light? like a deluge of sunshine. No, this could not be, for now upon a second look I saw that this flood of light thus streaming through the side of the mountain came through it like a mighty pencil of rays, and striking the opposite walls with its brilliancy a hundredfold increased, rebounded in a thousand directions, flooding the whole region with its effulgence and dying away in faint and pearl-like glimmer in the vast approach where I had first noted it. And therefore I understood that nature must have set a gigantic lens twice a thousand feet or more in diameter in the sloping side of this hollow mountain, a perfect lens of purest rock crystal, which, in gathering in its mysterious bosom the sunlight of the outer world, threw it intensely radiant and dazzling white into the gloomy depths of this world within a world, so that when the sun went up out there, it went up in here as well, but became cold as it was beautiful, bringing no warmth, no other cheer, save light, to this subterranean region which for thousands of centuries had lain locked in the crystal embrace of frozen lakes and brooks and rivers and torrents and waterfalls, once bubbling and flowing and rushing headlong through fair lands of the upper world, but suddenly checked in their course by some bursting forth of mighty pent-up forces and turned downward into these icy depths condemned to everlasting rest and silence. 
their crystals locked in a sleep that never would know an awakening, mocked in their dreams by this mysterious sunlight that came with the smile and the fair and winsome look of the real, and yet was so powerless to set them free as once it did when the springtime came in the upper world. All these thoughts and many others besides flitted through my mind as I stood looking up at that mighty lens in its setting of mightier rock. And so deeply impressed was I by the sight of such a great flood of sunlight pouring through this gigantic bull's eye which nature had set in the rocky side of the hollow mountain peak and illumine this underworld that the longer i gazed upon the wonderful spectacle the more firmly enthralled my senses became by it the deep silence the deliciously pure air the ever varying tints of the light as the mighty ice columns acting the part of prisons literally filled those vast chambers with the rainbow's glorious glow imparted unto the spell resting upon me such unearthly power that it might have held me there until my limbs hardened into icy crystals and my eyes looked out with a frozen stare had not the ever watchful bulger given a gentle tug at the skirt of my coat and aroused me from my enthralling meditation end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of baron trump's marvelous underground journey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 22. The Palace of Ice in the Golden Sunlight and What I Imagined It Might Contain. How We Were Halted by a Couple of Quaintly Clad Sentinels. The Coltic Works, His Frigid Majesty, King Gelidus. More about the Ice Palace, together with a description of the throne room. Our reception by the King and his daughter, Schneebule. Brief mention of Bullabrain, or Lord Hothead. Scarcely had I advanced a hundred yards beyond the portal, where I had halted when happening to turn my eyes to the other side, a sight met them which sent a thrill of wonder and delight through my form. There upon the highest terrace stood a palace of ice, its slender minarets, its high lifted towers, its rounded turrets, its spacious platform, and its broad flights of steps all glittering in the sunlight, as if gem-studded and jewel-set. It was a spectacle to stir the most indifferent heart, let alone one so full of ardor and buoyancy as mine. But, ah, uh, dear friends, even admitting that I can succeed in awakening in your minds even a faint conception of the beauty of this ice palace, as the sunlight fell full upon it at that moment, how can I ever hope to give you an idea of the unearthly beauty of this palace of ice and its glorious surroundings when the moon went up in the outer world at a later hour and its pale, mysterious light was poured through the mighty lens in the mountainside? and fell with celestial shimmer upon these walls of ice but the one thought that oppressed me now was can this beautiful abode be without a tenant without a living soul within its wonderful halls and chambers or may not its dwellers overtaken by the pitiless cold sit with wide open eyes and icy glare stark as marble in chairs of ice white frosted hair pressed against icy cushions and hands stiffened around crystal cups filled with frozen wine of topaz hue while the harper's fingers cling cramped to the wires stiff as the wires themselves and the last tones of the singer's voice lie in feathery crystals of frozen breath white at his feet Come what may, I resolved to lift the crystal knocker that might hang on the outer door of this palace of ice, and awaken the castellan, if his slumber were not that of death. In a few moments I had crossed the level space between me and the first terrace, which it would be necessary for me to scale in order to reach the second, and then the third, upon which stood the palace of ice. Imagine my more than surprise upon finding myself now at the foot of a magnificent flight of steps hewn into the ice with a master hand, and leading to the terrace above. Springing lightly up this flight with Bulger close at my heels, I suddenly set eyes upon two of the quaintest-looking human beings that I ever remembered seeing in all my travels. 
They looked for all the world like two big animated snowballs, being clad from top to toe in garments made of snow white fleece. Their skull caps likewise of white fur, leaving only their faces visible. In his right hand, each of them carried a very prettily shaped flint axe, mounted upon a helve of polished bone. Striding up to me and swinging their axes over my head in altogether too close proximity to my pole to be particularly pleasant, one of them cries out, Halt, sir, unless his frigid majesty Gelidus, king of the Cully Corps, awaits thy coming. His guards will let a signal from us roll a few thousand tons of ice down upon thee, if thou darest proceed another step. Therefore, stand fast, and tell us who thou art, and whether thou art expected. Gentlemen, said I, kindly lower those axes of yours, and I will convince you that his frigid majesty hath nothing to dread in me, for I am none other than the very small but very noble and very famous Sebastian von Trump, commonly known as the Little Baron. Never heard of thee in all my life, said both of the guards, as with one voice. But I have of you, gentlemen, I continued, for now I recollected what the learned Don Foom had said about the frozen land of the Cullyworps, or cold bodies. And as proof of my peaceful intent, like a true knight, I now offer you my hand and beg that you will conduct me into the presence of his frigid majesty. No sooner had the guard standing next to me drawn off his glove and grasped my hand, than he let it loose again with a cry of fright. Zounds, man, art thou on fire? Why, thy hand burned me like a flame of a lamp. Why, no, my friend, I said quietly, that's my ordinary temperature. And thy companion? Hath even a warmer heart than I have, was my reply. Well, our word for it, little baron, exclaimed one of the guards with a chuckle. There will be no place for thee except in the meat quarry. Possibly after thou hast been cooled off for a week or so, his frigid majesty will be able to have thee about. This was not a very cheerful prospect, for I had no particular desire to be laid away in the royal ice box for a week or so. Anyway, the only thing to be done was to insist upon being conducted at once into the presence of the king of the cult corps and abide by his decision. One of the guards, having saluted me by presenting his battle axe in real military style, faced about and began to ascend the grand staircase with intent to announce my arrival to his frigid majesty, while the other informed me that he would conduct me as far as the palace. I was wonderstruck with the beauty of the three staircases leading up to the ice palace. Massive balustrades with curiously carved balusters springing from towering pedestals crowned with beautiful lamps, all all, I say, all and everything, to the crystal clear sides of the lamps themselves, was fashioned from blocks of ice. It proved to be a good climb to the top of the third terrace, and I was not put out when the guard solemnly lowered his battle-axe of flint to bring me to its standstill. The sun in the upper world was, no doubt, nearing the horizon, for a deep and beautiful twilight suddenly sank upon the icy dominions of King Gelidus, and to my surprise and delight, through the great slabs of crystal-clear ice which served for windows to the palace, streamed a soft radiance, as if a thousand wax tapers were burning in the chambers and galleries indoors. It was a sight to gladden the eyes of any mortal, but if I had been spellbound by the beauty of its exterior, how shall I tell you, dear friends, of the curious splendor of the interior of Gelidus's palace of ice, as it burst upon me when I had crossed its threshold? Hallway led into hallway, chamber opened into chamber, through portals gracefully arched and winding staircases climbing to upper rooms, while hanging from lofty ceilings or resting on graceful pedestals, were a thousand alabaster lamps shedding light and perfume upon this glorious home of his frigid majesty Gelidus, king of the culty corps. Long rows of retainers, all in snow-white fur, lined the wide hallway as the guards conducted Bulger and me into the palace, and bowed in silence as we passed. To my more than wonder, I saw that the inner rooms were most sumptuously furnished, chairs and divans being scattered here and there, all covered with superb skins of white fur, while the floor too was carpeted with them, and as the soft radiance of the alabaster lamps fell upon these magnificent pelts, and set ten thousand jewels in the walls and ceilings of ice, I was ready to admit that I had never seen anything half so beautiful, and yet I was still outside the throne room of his frigid majesty. 
At length we came to one end of a broad hallway, which seemed shut off from the rest of the palace by a wall thickly encrusted with strings of great diamonds, each as big as a goose egg, extending from the ceiling to the floor, and turning back the shimmer of the lamps with such a flood of crystalline radiance that my eyes involuntarily closed before it. Think of my amazement when the two guards laying hold of this wall of jewels, as I deemed it, drew it to the right and left till there was room for me to pass. What I had taken for a wall of jewels was but a curtain made up of round bits of ice strung upon strings and hanging like a shower of diamonds there before me, as they glittered in the light of the lamps each side of them. I now stood in the throne room of his frigid majesty, the king of the Colty Corpse. Now I realized that what I had seen elsewhere in his palace of ice was in reality but a sample of its magnificence. For here, the splendor of King Gelidus's castle burst upon me in its fullest strength. Imagine a great round chamber lighted with the soft flames of perfumed oil streaming from a hundred alabaster lamps, the walls lined with broad divans covered with snow-white pelts, the floors thickly carpeted with the same glorious rugs, while on one side, glittering in the shimmer of the hundred massive lamps, stands the icy throne of the king of the Colty Corps, decked with snow-white skins, and he upon it, with Schneebule, his fair daughter, sitting at his feet, and all around and about him, group-wise, a hundred Colty Corps, the king, the princess, and the courtiers, all clad in skins whiter than the driven snow. And you, dear friends, will have some faint idea of the splendor of the scene which burst upon me as the two guards drew aside the strands of ice jewels at the end of the hallway in the Palace of Ice. Like all his subjects, King Gelidus looked out through the round window of his fur hood, just as a big good-natured boy does through his skating cap. The Colty Corps were not much taller than I, but were very stocky built, so that when broadened out by their thick fur suits, they really took on, at times, the appearance of animated snowballs. It would be hard for the fingers of the deftest hand to draw faces fuller of kindliness and good nature than those of the Colty Corps. Their small, honest gray eyes sparkled with a boniform glint, and so broad were their smiles that they were only about half visible through the round holes of their fur hoods. I was delighted with them from the very start, and the more so when I heard King Gelidus cry out in a cheery voice, A right crisp and cold welcome to our icy court, little baron. But from what our people tell us, thou earnest a pair of hands so hot that we beg thee to take a few days to cool off before thou touchest palms with any of the Colty Corps, and we also beg thee to be careful and not to lean against any of our richly carved panels, or to slide down any of our highly polished railings, or to handle the strands of our jewels, or sit down for any length of time on the front steps of our palace. And we make the same request of thy four-footed companion, who is said to be of even warmer disposition than thou. I bowed and kissed my hand to his frigid majesty, and assured him that I should make every effort to lower my temperature as speedily as possible, and in the meantime, that I should be extremely careful not to come into contact with any of the artistic carving of his palace of ice. As I pronounced these words, the whole company began to clap their hands, and as they did so, a cold shiver ran down my back, for there was a sound, methought, very much like the rattling of dry bones to that applause but I took good care not to let King Gelidus notice my fright. His frigid majesty now presented me to his daughter Schneebule, a pretty little maid of about sixteen crystal winters, with cheeks round as apples, and as deeply dimpled as the furrows of a crossbun. Her eyes twinkled as she looked upon Bulger and me, and turning to her frigid papa, she asked for leave to touch the tip end of my thumb. Which being done, she gave a squeaky little scream and began to blow on her tiny finger as if I had blistered it. King Gelidus also presented me to several of his court favorites, all men of the coldest blood in the nation. Their names were Jellikin, Prostifiz, Icicle, and Glacier Boy. They were all dreadfully slow thinkers when you questioned them very closely on any subject. It didn't take me very long to discover this. In fact, they requested me to be less warm in my manner, and not to ask them any posers, as they invariably found that deep thought caused a rise in their temperature. 
This was, to be honest about it, very annoying to me. For you know, dear friends, what a lodestone my mind is, never asleep, always in a quiver like a mariner's compass, pointing this way and that in search of the polar star of wisdom. Upon making known my trouble to his frigid majesty, King Gelidus, he most gracefully ordered one of his trusty attendants to conduct me to the triple-walled ice cell of a certain culty corp by the name of Pullibrain, that is, literally, Boiling Brain, a man who had been born with a hot head, and consequently with a very active brain. For fifty years King Gelidus had been doing his very best to refrigerate this subject of his, but without success and as I was just bursting with impatience to ask a whole string of questions concerning the culty corpse, you may imagine how delighted I was to make the acquaintance of Bullibrain, or Lord Hothead, as he was called among the culty corpse. But, dear friends, you must excuse me if I make this the end of the chapter, and stop here for a brief rest. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M.B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter 23. Lord Hothead again, and this time a fuller account of him. His wondrous tales concerning the culty quirps, where they came from, who they were, and how they managed to live in this world of eternal frost. The many questions I put to him, and his answers in full. Lord Bullibrain was never allowed to set foot inside the Palace of Ice. King Gelidus, backed by the opinion of his favorites, still indulged the belief that he would be able in the end to refrigerate him. True, he had been many years at the task so that it had now become a sort of hobby of his, and almost daily did his frigid majesty pay a visit to his hot-headed subject, and test his temperature by pressing his small ball of ice against his temples. To King Gelidus's mind, a man of so high a temperature was a continual menace to the peace and quiet of his kingdom. What if Lord Hothead in a dream should wander forth some night and fall asleep with his back against one of the walls of the ice palace? Might he not melt away enough of it to throw the whole glorious fabric into a slump and slush of debris? It was terrible to think of when he did think of it, and he thought of it quite often. But Bullibrain held no terrors for me, nor for Bulger either. In fact, Bulger was delighted to be stroked by a warm hand, and he and Bullibrain and I soon became the very best of friends. But his frigid majesty was so alarmed when he heard of his friendship that he was seized with quite a spasm of warmth, for, thought he, the united heat of three hotheads might work some terrible harm to the welfare of his people. So he issued the coldest kind of decree carved on a tablet of ice, that Bullibrain and I should on no one day pass more than a half hour together, that we should never touch palm to palm, sleep in the same room, eat from the same dish, or sit on the same divan. These regulations were annoying, but I followed them to the letter. And when King Gelidus saw how careful I was to yield the strictest obedience to his decree, he conceived a genuine affection for me, and sent several magnificent pelts to the ice house, which had been assigned to Bulger and me, for of course it would not have been safe for us to lodge in the palace itself. But his frigid majesty held out the flattering prospect that the very moment Bulger and I should become properly refrigerated, apartments in the palace would be assigned to us, and, in fact, that I should be permitted to eat at the royal table. Who are the culty corpse? Where did these strange folk come from? How did they ever find their way down into this world of eternal frost? And above all, where do they get their food and clothing from? These were a few of the questions which I was so impatient to have answered that my temperature was raised a whole degree, and I was obliged to sleep with only one single pelt between me and my divan of crystal ice. For a man bred and born in so cold a country as the land of the Colty Corps, Bullibrain had an extremely quick and active mind. On account of his rapid heartbeat and the consequent high temperature of his body, he was not able to do his writing on slabs of ice as other learned culty corpse had done, for it would not have been a pleasant thing for him to see a poem which he had just finished literally melt away in his hands without so much as leaving an ink stain behind. 
so he had been obliged with king gelidus's permission to do his writing on thin tablets of alabaster before he began to talk to me about the progenitors of the colty corpse he showed me a map of the country in the upper world once inhabited by them and traced for me the course they had sailed upon abandoning that country and described the beautiful shores they had landed upon in their search for a new home i saw at a glance that it was greenland which bullibrain was thus unconsciously describing and knowing as i did that in past ages greenland had been a land of blue skies warm winds green meadows and fertile valleys before moving mountains of ice came down from the north and crushed all life out of it i listened with breathless interest to his wonderful tales of its beautiful lakes nestled at the foot of vine-clad mountains all of which bullibrain now looked upon in fair visions inherited from his ancestors and I also knew that it must have been the Arctic Ocean, which had been traversed by the ships of the Colty Corps, who had then landed upon the, in those days, sunny shores of northern Russia. But the mountains of ice could sail too, and they followed the fleeing Colty Corps like mighty monsters, dashing themselves with terrible roar and crash upon the peaceful shores, which they soon transformed into a wilderness of berg, of glacier, and of flow. Only a handful of the Colty Corps survived, and these, in their dumb despair, taking refuge in the clefts and caverns of the North Urals, could from their hiding places look upon one of the strangest sights that had ever greeted human eyes. So rapid had been the advance of these mighty masses of ice, crashing against the mountainsides and rending the very rocks in their fury, that the air gave up its warmth, and the sun was powerless to give it back again. The animals of the wild wood and the beasts of the field, overtaken in their flight, perished as they ran and stood there stark and stiff, with heads uptossed and muscles knotted. Then, by the thousands and ten times thousands, the crushed crystals of the pursuing floods caught up like moss and leaves in a mountain torrent, and packed in every cave and cavern on the way, carrying broader and loftier portals into these subterranean chambers so that they might do their work the better. And these, then, O Bullabrain, are your meat quarries? I exclaimed. Whence ye draw your daily food? Even so, little baron, replied the hot-headed Colty Quirk, and not only our food, but the skins which serve us so admirably for clothing in this cold underground world, and the oil, too, which burns in our beautiful alabaster lamps, besides a hundred other things, such as bone for hues and handles, horn for needles and buttons and eating utensils, wool for the weaving of our undergarments, and magnificent pelts of bear and seal and walrus, which laid upon our benches and divans of crystal ice, transformed them into beds and couches, which even an inhabitant of thy world might envy. But, O oh, Bullabrain, I cried out, have ye not almost exhausted these supplies? Will not death from starvation soon stare ye all in the face in these deep and icy caverns of the underworld, visited by the sun's light yet unwarmed by it? Nay, little baron, answered Bullabrain with a smile almost as warm as one of my own. Let not that thought give thee a moment's alarm, for we have as yet barely raised the lid of this ice box of nature's packing. We are not large eaters, anyway, continued Lord Hothead, for while it is true that we are not indolent people, for his frigid majesty's palace and our dwellings need constant repair, and new hatchets and axes must be chipped out in the flint quarries, and new lamps carved, and new garments woven. Yet it is also true that we take life rather easy. We have no enemies to slay, 
no quarrels to settle, no gold to fight over, no land to drive our fellow creatures from and fence in, nor can we be ill if we were willing to be, for in this pure, cold, crisp air, disease would try in vain to sow her poison germs. Hence, needing no doctors, we have none, as we have no lawyers either, or merchants to sell us what belongs to us already. His frigid majesty is an excellent king. I never read of a better one. I doubt that his like exists in the upper world. Always cool-headed, no thought of conquest, no dreams of power, no longings for empty pomp and show ever enter his mind. Since the day his father died and we set the great Holtecourt crown of crystal ice upon his cool brow, his temperature has never risen but half a degree, and that was only for a brief hour or so, and was occasioned by a mad proposal of one of his counselors, who claimed that he had discovered an explosive compound, something like the gunpowder of thy world, I fancy, by which he could shatter the glorious window of rock crystal set in the mountain dome of our underworld and let in the warm sunshine. Did his frigid majesty Gelidus put this daring culty work to death? I asked. Oh dear no, replied Bullabrain. He merely ordered him to be refrigerated for so many hours a day until all his feverish projects had been chilled to death. For no doubt, little baron, a man of thy deep learning knows full well that all the ills which thy world suffers from are the children of fevered brains, of minds made restless and visionary by the high temperature of the blood which gallops through the approaches to the dome of thought, stirring up wild dreams and visions as thy son lifts the poisonous vapor from the stagnant pool. The more I listened to Bullabur, the more I liked him. The fact of the matter is, I preferred to sit in his narrow cell with its plain walls of ice lighted up by a single alabaster lamp and converse with him to loitering in the splendid throne room of his frigid majesty King Gelidus. But Bulger had discovered that the pelts of Princess Schneeboule's divan were much thicker, softer, and warmer than the single one allowed Lord Hothead and therefore he preferred spending his time with her. But fearing lest he might get into mischief, I didn't dare to leave him alone with the princess for too long a time. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M.B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood Chapter 24 Some few things concerning the dear little Princess Schneeboule How she and I became fast friends 
and how one day she conducted Bulger and me into her favorite grotto to see the little man with the frozen smile. Something about him. What came of my having looked upon him quite fully described. At the time of Bulger's and my arrival in the land of the cold corpse, the Princess Schneebule was about 15 years of age, and I must say that rarely had it been my good fortune to make the acquaintance of such a sweet-tempered, lovable little creature. She flitted about the ice palace like a beam of sunlight, and there was nothing of the spoiled child about her, although a bit mischievous at times. Her voice was as full of music as a skylark's, and it was not many days before she and I had become the best of friends in the world. Now you must know, dear friends, that according to the law of the Kulti Corps, a princess is left absolutely free to choose her own husband and his frigid majesty was very anxious that Schneeboule should pick hers out as soon as possible. Moreover, the law of the land gave her perfect freedom to choose a husband of high or low degree, provided he was young enough. The way in which a culty court princess was required to make known her preference was to press a kiss upon the cheek of the young man whom she might settle upon. This ennobled him at once, and he became the heir apparent to the throne of ice, and entitled to sit on its steps until he should be crowned king. Now, his frigid majesty was delighted to see this friendship spring up between Schneeboule and me, for he had hoped to make use of my influence to bring her to set the necessary kiss on some youth's cheek before I took my departure from the cold kingdom of the Kulti Corps. I gave him the word of a nobleman that I would do my best to carry out his wishes. With Schneeboule for a guide, Bulger and I often went for walks through the splendid ice grottoes of her father's kingdom, selecting days when the sunlight of the outer world poured strongest through the mighty lens set in the side of the mountain. Then these grottoes took on a splendor that my poor tongue is powerless to describe. Their crystal mazes glittered as if their walls were set with massive jewels, most wonderfully cut and polished, and as if their ceilings were fretted with gems so peerless that all the gold of the upper world would fall far short of pain for them. Here, there, and everywhere, the skill of the Kulti Quirks had carved and chiseled graceful flights of steps, broad landings with majestic columns, and winding corridors lined with long rows of statues, single and group ones, and ever and anon, visitor came upon a terrace, where seated upon a fur-covered divan, he might look out upon the bewildering beauty of King Gelidus' icy domains, arch touching arch, and dome springing from dome, while over and above all, through the gigantic lens in its granite setting, a mile above our heads, streamed a flood of glorious sunlight, lighting up this world within a world with a radiance so grand and so complete as to seem to be a sun of a far greater splendor than the one that warmed the upper world and bathed it in so many gorgeous hues at morn and eve. Hardly a day went by now that 
that the princess of the Golden Corps did not surprise either Bulger or me with some gift or other. To tell the truth, dear friends, although my Russian coat was fur trimmed, yet I began to feel the need of warmer garments after a week's sojourn in the icy domain of King Gelidus. And I think Schneeble must have heard my teeth chattering. For one morning, upon entering the Palace of Ice, I was delighted to be presented with a full suit of fur, precisely similar to the one worn by King Gelidus himself. Nor was Bulger forgotten by the loving little princess, for with her own hands she had knitted him blanket of the softest wool, which she belted so snugly around his body and tied so tightly around his neck that henceforth he felt perfectly comfortable in the chill air of the home of the cold horse. One day the Princess Schneeboule said to me, Oh, come, little baron, come to my favorite bottle. Now that the sun's rays are bright within it, there shall be see a wonder. A wonder? Princess Schneeboule? Yes, little baron, a wonder. She repeated. The little man with the frozen smile. Little man with the frozen smile? I echoed. Come and see, come and see, little baron. Schneeboule hurrying on ahead. In a few moments we had reached the grotto and bounded into it with the princess leading the way. Suddenly she halted in front of a magnificent block of crystal ice, clear as polished glass, and cried out, There! Look! There is the little man with the frozen smile! Even now, as the thought of that moment comes over me, I feel something of the thrill of half fear, half joy, as my eyes fell upon the little creature shot in that superb block of ice, himself a part of it, himself its heart, its contents, its mystery. There in its center, in easy posture, with wide open eyes, and with what might be called a smile upon his face, that is a glint of kindliness and affection in its strange eyes. With their overhanging brows sat a small animal of the chimpanzee race. He had possibly been asleep when the icy flood struck him, dreaming of beautiful trees bending beneath purple fruit, of cloudless skies above and a coral beach below, and death had come to him so quickly that he had become a brother to this block of ice, while the happy dream was still in his thoughts. It was wonderful. It was more than wonderful. Spellbound by the strange spectacle, I stood there, I know not how long, with my eyes looking into his. At last, Schneeboule's voice aroused me. Ha ha! She laughed. Look, little Baron, Bulger is trying to kiss his poor dead brother. In truth, Bulger did have his nose pressed firmly against the block of ice in his effort to scent the strange animal imprisoned in that crystal cell so near and yet so far beyond the reach of his keen scent. Well, little baron, cried Schneeble, did I not speak truly? Have I not shown thee the little man with the frozen smile? Indeed thou hast, fair princess, was my reply, and I cannot tell thee how grateful I am to thee for having done so. Then, as she plucked me by the sleeve, I pleaded, 